part of the English professor's job in the classroom is to get students to question um, the power structures that create the discourses um, that you discuss. Um, but because the classroom is a highly hierarchized space, when you walk into a classroom, you project a particular attitude towards the power that you yourselves hold as professors. Um, so what is your ideal power dynamic in the classroom, and what would you want that to accomplish? What would you want it to look like? I am a firm believer that a really effective teacher has to parlay or exude a certain kind of charisma. That is to say, one has to initially take charge of the class. This is less important in a smaller setting than it is in a class of 100, 140, 200 students. One has to establish not one's authority in terms of lording it over students, but there has to be a sort of focus of attention, as it were. Um, one has to be on the same page. You only have three hours per week with these students, and you have to get a certain amount of stuff across, if you know, or you want to. Having said that, it's also extremely important to to self-critique that power dynamic and to think about the fact, to make it apparent to students that one has a certain amount of knowledge that one wants to impart to them, but that's the starting point. And I always try to make that apparent, that I, you know, I'm there for a reason I do have, and I tend to lecture more than Allison does, and I try to get away from that because I do want to hear, it's not that I don't want to hear what the students have to say, I do want to hear what the involvement is, and of course, as you know, I encourage people to interrupt me and stop me. I, I just don't know how to do the Socratic thing, it's one of my failings as a teacher. Nonetheless, I think it's important to establish a center of authority, as it were, and then immediately to put that center under erasure, if I can put it that way, or to think about what the, what the stakes of that are. Because one can't simply erase the fact that one is a tenured professor standing in front of a group of students, mm -hmm. for whom they're paying a lot of money <laughs> um, to, 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 to teach them. So one has to, I think, make all those things conscious to the group. My own approach is to um, assume the authority uh, less in the performance of the teaching than in the scaffolding of the course. So for example, everything about the course is laid out in advance. All the expectations are really, really clear. But to move as quickly as possible away from the student as a passive consumer. Um, because what I'm going to tell them, or what I tell them that I'm, they're paying for is not my knowledge, but the transformative experience of education. In order for that transformation to take place, they have to be participants. So they're not paying for me. And they're paying for uh, a, a, an environment in which they can grow and learn. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's all about, um, but the scaffolding as absolutely has to be in place. There can't be any room for a kind of, this is simply subjective. Yeah. This, this is the, these are the tools that I'm going to give you. Um, I will teach you the tools, and then you will use them. And, um, but, you, but you have to be a full partner in that. And mm -hmm. one of the things I think um, that I've noticed at Western is students tend to be more passive. Um, even at graduation than I would hope. So for me, I'm teaching first year English next year, and the entire goal of the year is going to be to create really active students who feel committed to their learning as something that is their project, um, an investment in themselves, not uh, something they need to do to get a piece of paper or something they need to do to get a certain grade in my class. Um, and as much as possible, I'm going to make that be their responsibility. So they, the first essay, they'll have a comment. Um, we'll have talked about what the expectations and the grading rubric for the paper will be, but then they'll come in and then we'll discuss together what the grade on that paper is going to be, um, be based on their sense of my comments. Because a lot of students don't even read comments. They just look at the number, and then they feel either frustration or elation, mm -hmm. depending on what they've got. So Rita Gardner, in the article that we're responding to for the Word Board, um, suggests that one of the problems with authentic leadership based on self-knowledge and to a certain extent on the leader's charisma, which we've talked about um, a little bit, is that people may not recognize a, leader a leader's style as leadership if that leader defies some social expectations. So more specifically, Gardner writes that there are often tensions between a leader's beliefs and a community's willingness to agree with their position. So what happens in the classroom and what happens to the classroom dynamic when students have social expectations about leadership or about the, um, the discourses of leadership um, that they're being introduced to when those are defied? Sure. I, I, to go back to, you know, to the word charisma, um, I mean, I think, I think the idea of charisma itself is, is important. What I really meant more by that was the fact that one has to be aware of the fact that one moves into a room immediately as the center of attention and therefore one has to take responsibility for the fact that one is doing uh, and one brings a whole set of, of uh, you know, of 
thoughts and feelings and beliefs, as it were, and one has to make those transparent to one's audience as quickly as possible. Um, having said that, as I understand Gardner uh, treating your rent or thinking about a rent, uh, that can't be the only place uh, where, where teaching happens, as it were. One has to, one has cultivated a certain self-knowledge, but one has to then be willing, and I find this difficult sometimes, uh, willing to give up one's ego, as it were, to set that aside completely and to allow the fact that it's going to, as I said earlier, be resisted, be attacked, be dissented against entirely. The great thing about that moment is that it is, and I hate this word, or I hate this phrase, but it's what's called a teachable moment. But in fact it is. It's a place where you can, you can then have a dialogue with the other person with a kind of respect for both sides. And, you know, traditionally that didn't always happen, and it is happening a lot more now. Thank God. Thank whomever. <laughs> Well, and I think um, I'm more and more suspicious of the idea of charisma. I think I used to believe that it would be, um, it could be a means to an end in a classroom. But now my, my um, in a celebrity culture, in a, in a world in which the students more and more, you know, will be passively consuming and identifying with modes of, for lack of a better word, idolatry. Um, I think it's even more important to move away from that. Um, and, and I found it... Um, even graduate students sometimes will, will make jokes about professors being rock stars. And for me, um, that's just such a dangerous dynamic to get into because of the kind of potential for hostility and projection, resentment it can set up if, if one doesn't feel oneself to be a rock star, either now or in the future. Or, <laughs> so, um, so with the undergraduates, and, and again, I'm getting older, so I'm less likely to be <laughs> viewed idolatrously by my students. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm going to try and, and work toward an ethics of dignity, um, self-respect among the students, um, less a, a less worshipful mode of, of, of teaching. Because once again, you realize as you get older that it's not about the immediate impact. It's mm -hmm. about the long-term mm -hmm. strategy of how mm -hmm. one parlays one's thought mm -hmm. against others, with others, and out in the world. And that's a hard one insight insofar as it is an insight. And parlaying that to students, I'm finding, is, is really the bigger picture as it 